two motifs that that I can track through my life. One that are powerful, and one is service, and the other is adventure. What we're doing, what SciTech is right now, happens to combine both of those very, uh, very, in, in, in no uncertain terms, and service and adventure. It's a real adventure, uh, and scientifically, to to solve a problem, to discover a, a cure for a disease, or to pinpoint the source of a new disease. It's also a real adventure to go out into the field and find, let's say, a uh, something in the, in a paleontological discovery or an archaeological discovery that no one knew about that was discovered in a remote viewing classroom or remote viewing room then to go into the field and, and to find it in, in its location in situ. That's adventure, that's discovery and uh, technical remote viewing combines both of those things. That's why I, I, I think I pursued it for so long and so vigorously. I got into remote viewing because I, I was fascinating with it as an idea, but more importantly, as an intelligence officer, I needed a combat multiplier. I needed something that would give me more bang for the buck, so to speak, that would help me solve intelligence tools. What we had at our disposal in terms of 19, circa 1980 intelligence techniques, methods, and equipment, and technology, wasn't good enough to help me solve specifically what was the makeup of the SS-18 missile. What were the Soviets really doing in the biochemical arena? Was there such a thing as non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation weapons? What kinds of particle beam weapons were the Soviets developing or the Chinese? Was it what kind of directed energy weapons? Neutral particle beam? Uh, uh, charged particle beam weapons, high-powered lasers, high-powered microwaves, what were the polarizations, what were the frequencies, what were the pulse durations, those kinds of things. I didn't have what I needed. My agents on the ground could not give me that. The satellites were not doing a good enough job. We weren't getting enough from the signal intelligence, from communications intercept. I needed more. And what remote viewing gave me was the more. In some, in some, in some cases, it was not only the finished piece of the puzzle, or that piece that allowed me to see the pattern emerge that I needed to be able to say, it's a duck. It looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, and it is a duck. I needed something, I needed that finished piece many times, and remote viewing could, good that, could give that to me. It wasn't that so much as giving me the original piece of the puzzle, for which we had no pieces at all. In many cases, we did not know anything about a weapon system. We ha heard rumors that one existed. Was it real or not? It was also my responsibility to choose, to, to decide what were the most threatening projects, what were the most threat, what were the greatest threats. That was also my responsibility. Obviously, nuclear weapons delivery systems were always at number one. But there were other things that were rising, weapons of mass destruction, new forms of, of new types of weapons that had their genesis in new technologies and in, in different areas of science that were, were nascent. And my responsibility was to decide where to put our intelligence collections resources to gain more information about these pot the potential threat of these, of the, in these new arenas, in these other arenas. In my capacity as an intelligence officer at national intelligence levels, I knew what was at my disposal in terms of collection, uh, collection uh, systems. But this is the one that could get behind all of the green doors. And this is the one that worked for me that gave me the, the final pieces of the puzzle to allow me to be able to go to the National Security Council and say th definitively they are doing this here and this is what this is. We've learned that some U.S. intelligence officials believe they figured out how to train people to be psychic and the Pentagon has used psychics during conflicts ranging from the Iran hostage crisis to the Gulf War. Now some retired spooks have even taken their skills into the business world, 
doing psychic intelligence work for American companies. With U.S. forces about to liberate Kuwait City, a senior American official was worried that Saddam would leave behind a trap, biological weapons designed to kill American troops. So the official telephoned Ed Danes, recently retired Army intelligence officer and president of a new company called SciTech. Uh, I was called on the phone, and I was uh, uh, told that uh, I, there were 48 hours. Could I do anything about this? My answer was, was yes. Dame says he searched Kuwait City without ever leaving the basement of his home in Jessup, Maryland. You see, Ed Dames is a psychic, a trained remote viewer. For those who believe, remote viewing is the ability to see things far away in time or space, to gather information about objects thousands of miles away and events that have yet to occur. Think of an automated database search where you go from the general to the specific. Uh, in essence, that, that's what we do, although we have a database somewhere that we don't understand. It's connected with the unconscious. So Dames logged into his unconscious, using the tools of his trade, a secret six-stage psychological process and a pen and plain white paper to document the trip, Dames directed his mind to Kuwait City. There he found no biological weapons, but his search did lead to a weapons laboratory in Iraq, then on to a pair of small compressors filled with deadly biological agents. Oh, I'd say it was uh, probably that long by this wide by uh, that high. Heavy? Uh, see, this is something we do in stage uh, six. We can actually, we can do a model of the structure and we can get a sense of how heavy something is. Uh, certainly not as heavy as a power tool uh, device, but, uh, oh, perhaps nine or ten pounds. According to Dames, the weapon was to be used for an Iraqi-sponsored terrorist attack against a foreign airport. So he called back his Bush administration contact and said Kuwait City was clear. The attack went as planned and no biological weapons were discovered. Now we can't prove or disprove the story of this still secretive former spook, but Cairo has confirmed that the Defense Intelligence Agency did use psychics during the Gulf War. A key U.S. official told us the program was used to give intelligence leads during the whole Desert Storm period. It was part of a million dollar a year psychic intelligence project, just the latest in a long string of secret American research. Stansfield Turner became director of the CIA in 1977. There he learned that the agency had once employed a successful psychic. He had drawn some pictures of places in the Soviet Union that he had never been and which seemed to turn out to be accurate. Uh, he had passed on and we'd never heard from him since and uh, we hadn't engaged anybody else in that field. Perhaps, but even if the CIA did stop using psychics, the Pentagon continued. ESP skeptic and University of Oregon professor Ray Hyman studied the subject for the U.S. Army. The intelligence did try to use psychics in trying to find General Dozier, who was ca uh, captured by the Red Brigade in, Indi in Italy. Uh, apparently, psychics were used to see where our hostages were in Iran, and um, the Navy has used psychics apparently to uh, locate um, uh, Russian submarines. Where they were. That submarine program was reportedly called Project Aquarius. We asked the Secretary of the Navy how it was going. I really have no personal knowledge of that project at this point, so I, I can't answer the question, Mark. So you don't know about the project now? Whether it's oh, I, know, I know about the project, but I can't answer the question. Um, is it true that that project involved um, people who were tracing the movements of those submarines through ESP? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that question. A lot of this is classified, but generally... Congressman Norm Dix is on the House Intelligence Committee and confirms the use of psychic spooks. And there are some that have a record of being relatively accurate and having some ability to, in essence, foresee what is going to happen. And obviously, in the world of intelligence, that can be very, very important. We had access to the best possible evidence that the government could provide us with, and we had the government and the Army uh, helping us out, and the Defense Department, uh, and we checked everything out. We went and visited the major laboratories where this research is being done, and we could find no evidence to support any of these claims. Yet a major Princeton University study has concluded that remote viewing is possible. 
and more and more businesses are now hiring Ed Dames for research help and even a little corporate espionage. In fact, we get most of our, uh, our follow-on customers from word of mouth by you ought to see what these guys can do type of uh, uh, comments. Ed Dame says U.S. companies have successfully used his services to gather information on everything from future international events to new automobile technology. I heard rumors about the remote viewing military program during the 80s. However, in the early 90s, I heard that a prominent member of the team had gone private into the private sector and was living in New Mexico. And so I went down to meet him. And to make a long story short, I was trained by him. And shortly afterwards, he asked me to head up his commercialization of the company and the, the, the skill which he was teaching, technical remote viewing. Uh, my background prior to that had been 10 plus years working in clinical psychology, but my roots had been in the entertainment business. And when I had met Ed and was trained, I had dropped out of the you know, field of working in hospitals for six years, and I was re-entrenched in the entertainment business for those six years prior to meeting Ed. So the first thing I did when I accepted the position was move SciTech to the hub of the media and entertainment world, which was Beverly Hills. And, uh, and we began to expand the training program, loosen up the, the requirements that, that existed for accepting trainees into the program. And we began training civilians from all walks of life. Um, however, it, this was impractical because really what our goal was was to get these, the skill into as many hands as possible, to get it to the hands of the public. And it was just impractical. Training 30 people a year was not going to do it, clearly. And that's when we decided to put it on videotape format and uh, we had a live crew in the classroom live for almost a year and there was no script. Technical remote viewing is a skill. It's not meant to be an experience. It's an attention management skill. There are other few important points. One important point is that we're not going anywhere as a remote viewer. When we, when we use the terms getting the target or going to the target, those are misnomers. What we actually are doing is perceiving a person, place, thing, or an event. That's what you'll be learning to do in this tape. As a pattern of information, our minds are turning our attention first our conscious attention toward the task at hand that is remote viewing our unconscious attention follows our conscious attention and it overlays a pattern of information in the collective unconscious in what we call in TRV terms the matrix in the matrix is a pattern of information for all ideas ideas have a reality all their own so we're connecting our own minds, our own personal unconsciouses are connecting with that, with that idea that we turn our attention to in the collective. That's all that we're doing. The perceptions that we get are not the perceptions that we get if we were really at the site, although it may appear, it may appear that we're really there. We are not. We're reconstructing events and things not in our own mind.
never really heard of remote viewing up until uh, I think it was 95 or 96 and it was it was for me it was the fact that the US government was involved with this over a long period of time and that the, there was a research portion and there was an operational portion to to this and I just happen to know that the US government doesn't put money in year after year after year for something that is not producing some kind of results and that was that was the key for me I really came at it from a, a left brain aspect that there really is something to this in the minds of those who viewed Ed Dames as a, as a potential general officer my retirement was viewed as a loss obviously okay. that's one perspective another perspective is I was a a very loose cannon on deck and still am to a certain degree I still possess a great deal of very classified knowledge I think that my uh, uh, the former agencies that I of, of which I was a member are concerned that I might uh, I, I might talk about some of the projects that were very classified and I won't do that um, uh, they should know me better than that and most of them most of my former peers know me better than that they 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 know how patriotic I was they know that service was paramount to me and they also know why I left the army and why I left the defense intelligence agency to pursue other things that were more exciting and more of a challenge to me my superiors knew that Ed Dames could not be satisfied unless he was thrown certain types of bones, those bones being supreme challenges that nobody else could crack or that the military industrial scientific community said was impossible. Those are the challenges I wanted and where I was most successful. I ran out of those challenges at the end of the Cold War. That's why I founded SciTech, exactly that reason, because uh, I felt like I was outrunning my uh, superior's uh, wisdom. In some cases, I was. But in many cases, I felt like they were moving too slowly, and I was my missions were being encumbered by the institution of which I was a member, and I was being en encumbered by the not-so-wise decisions of my, my superior officers. Now, that's arrogance, I, I admit. But that's, that's what I've chosen to do, to get out. And the, the, more importantly, things like the UFO problem, the problem being what are they? They being a multivariate, uh, a varied uh, a group of phenomena. Those things could not have been pursued within the charter of the Department of Defense or CIA or the National Intelligence Collection Agencies at, at all. They had to be pursued privately. And because the UFO problem was the most significant challenge to me, the one I really wanted to pursue, I had to take it outside of Department of Defense charterdom into the uh, arena of a uh, private corporation. And that's what I did. There are some that wanted to nail my ass to the wall, obviously. I mean, I was. I, uh, it was, it was unthinkable to do what I did, to take a former military tool that was still a uh, that had that was still within the confines of, of military intelligence, take it, remove it from military intelligence, and put it into the public arena. That that took any number of my superior officers by by surprise and and shock. If I would have left the service like any other intelligence officer and gone into a traditional job, airline pilot or corporate executive <clears throat> or a CEO at a co company somewhere or an entrepreneurial position, there would have been no problem. The problem is that SciTech, one of, one of our own charters, is strategic intelligence collection. That's one of the things that we do. It could be global or geophysical, but it could also be military and social. Uh, when is the next hydrogen bomb going to be uh, exploded and where? Where are the terrorists? These are the same types of problems, the same types of missions that I was tasked with executing and prosecuting in the military. And because of that, 
That's a gecko, one of my house guests. Because of that, he's laughing at me, I, actually, the one up there. <clears throat> because the mission was very similar in many degrees, that's not to say that uh, some of the work that SciTech does, that uh, finding uh, a missing aircraft, for instance, or uh, the Amelia Earhart project that we're currently involved in, has nothing to do with military at all. But a lot of the work does. We are interested in what North Korea is doing right now. How close are they to thinking about a nuclear attack on the South? Those kinds of problems are so close to what I used to do. I do have to be careful about the way I talk to the public about them because I don't want to wander over into a very classified arena, uh, an arena that I, I, I left some time ago. So because of the propinquity, the, 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 the connection and the closeness between some of what SciTech does today and most of what I did in the past, there is some degree of care that I must use and how I choose my words or what to say or not to say. Now let's turn the clock back to 1991. Saddam Hussein is sitting on the top of a vast stockpile of deadly biological weapons pointed at our troops. And these stockpiles were hidden deep in the desert. How did we find them? Our next guest says that he and his company found them through ESP. Let's welcome Ed Dames. Thank you, Ed, for joining us. Um, I suppose I'm not surprised. We called the Army, and they, of course, won't comment about this. Uh, what's, your, what's your reaction to that? Well, both the Army and the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency to whom we were transferred, uh, it will still remain pretty mum for, for years to come on that kind of project. You know, a, a country has biological weapons, and that information is kept secret in, in, in some place. You then do what? We, I, as operations officer, I was the operations and training officer of the unit, would formulate a targeting package, and we would, in essence, use a satellite photograph or an agent's description of a place on the ground, and uh, we would go into an either an altered state, this was trained, a trained program, or we would use the techniques that are commercially available now to uh, provide information on purses, pla places, uh, things, or events. So you're using uh, sort of acceptable, uh, accepted technology that we're familiar with, like satellite photos, and so you get satellite photos, you sort of get as much information as the science can give you, is that correct? Uh, we don't need that, but we'd like to have that. We actually don't need it. It makes our work a little bit harder. We can come up with the same results if we had nothing at all. Uh, you, you, it's not lost on you. This sounds fantastic, obviously. I, what, I'm sure what, it is. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to help it be clearer what you're talking about. Um, you go into an altered state, and, and using telepathy, you can determine... What? Telepathy is more of a, an active word. Remote viewing, the way that we conduct it, is a passive thing. We no longer use altered states. A discovery at Stanford Research Institute in the, in the early 80s, 1982, allowed us to use a different technique that we call coordinate remote viewing. That was the military term. All right, but this is a mental process that That's you're correct. doing. That's correct. It's a psychic process. And, and uh, what do you get? You, you, uh... We get detailed words and sketches, and we can uh, uh, put together models using our hands, uh, words, sketches, and models that allow us to reconstruct events, places, uh, uh, provide a lot of detail on people, intent, those kinds of things. And this is accurate. You're telling us this is accurate. Uh, it's accurate to the extent that my company pr uh, provides a 100% money-back guarantee on the products we provide to our commercial clients. No, that's, no one has been able to do that in uh, history. Psychically yeah. produced data, 100% correct, the product that we provide. So, for example, Saddam Hussein, biological weapons, what is it that you did? Uh, the United Nations, the head of the UN biological and chemical and nuclear uh, inspection team, had bottomed out. She could not use CIA, KGB, MI5, or six British intelligence uh, products uh, to locate. Pro you have products, I'm sorry, the, the word product sounds funny to me. Uh, the information, intelligence. In the okay, intelligence, intelligence bottomed out. The intelligence yes. community could not There was no, no more information, provide. they could not find out anything. Okay. No, unlike nuclear weapons, for instance, it's very easy to spot magnetrons and large devices. Right, Biological okay. weapons are easy to hide and It's store. hard to spot with the technology. Correct. So we, in essence, we essentially turn our, our attention and our unconscious attention towards Saddam Hussein, and we qualified the term with biological weapons, 
program. And we searched that out. Think of a collective unconscious database, if you will. And we went using that as a search term. We go into the collective unconscious using very structured, highly disciplined and rigorous techniques, and we pull out details. And what did you get? Well, we, uh, we described places, former bunkers that had been uh, disguised as bombed out facilities under which he was hiding uh, pharmaceutical products that were in reality biological warfare toxins. This, you know, it's, it's so fantastic. It's like, you know, uh, again, it's not lost on you that this is hard for the average person to believe. I understand, no. and uh, that, that's, uh, it's very difficult to believe. I think that's one of the reasons that the program was so classified. Not be, uh, one of the reasons was our target list, the targets that we were interested in. Two is, it, is the degree of effectiveness that the program had. But the reason, really, that it was so highly compartmented was embarrassment, fear of ostracism, embarrassment on the part of the service being connected with the occult. But the... Uh but, but in fact, although it's uh, for public relations purposes is not spoken about out loud, you're saying that like the CIA and the other uh, intelligence agencies utilize this technique um, of remote viewing? They utilized it at first, at first meaning the, the mid-1980s, as a tactic of desperation when all else failed. Later on when we began to prove our effectiveness across the board to the Army, Navy, and Air Force, we uh, were utilized in more common operations less critical operations, but, it's still, uh, but we it's were still particularly used in life or death situations or when, a, when uh, deadly force needed to be applied. Can anyone do this? Uh, I think that uh, anyone can. It appears to be innate, a natural faculty, but like uh, language, it needs to be trained. There's a syntax and a grammar that needs to be applied. Hi, um, I was wondering how long it takes to teach someone to do what you do. Uh, in the early days, it took, I taught my military team, uh, it took us about three and a half months to install the skills. We do it now commercially in a very intensive program in seven days, but it is very intensive. Can you then plant thoughts in somebody's head? We cannot do that using uh, psychic mind-body techniques. There are ways of doing that, but it requires machinery and electronics, and I can't go into those. Are techniques. others doing this against us? I mean, could someone read the president or the Joint Chiefs of Staff's thoughts and use it against us? As a trained team, in fact, my Soviet counterparts, the KGB extra sensor team, was able to do that. Can you determine things like uh, future lottery numbers? Uh, we can very easily look at very large events, events that have a large uh, momentum along a trajectory into the future. But things that are very small, have a weak signal, or what we would describe as a small spike in the future, are very difficult for us to do. So things like lottery numbers are probably uh, not doable. Okay. Sorry. Well, when we return, we're going to try and make some uh, extra sense of these extrasensory powers with our entire panel of ESP people. Stay with us. The reason why I accepted the position of, that Ed had offered me of commercialization of the company and the skills was because it was such an impossible challenge. I mean, here we had something that was never heard of. And not only that, to, to say that we could train people to become more accurate than the world's best known psychics consistently, repeatedly, sounded unbelievable. So it was really the ultimate challenge. In France, a man by the name of René Orcalier, a Frenchman, was conducting an experiment that we call today beaconing where a person sits at a table here, another person in another room sits at a table, and in front of that person is a photograph. On cue, the sender attempts to communicate telepathically with the receiver information about the photograph. Okay? 
Is this remote viewing? No. It's telepathy. If I am this person in this room and choose to know about that photograph right there, I do not need telepathic contact with this individual because I'm going into the collective unconscious where the pattern of information about that photograph exists. That's remote viewing. If the photograph was of, let's say this is a sheet of paper, uh, a, a photograph, and here it was a, a sun, and here it was a western scene with a uh, a horse, great horse, and uh, a rider. And um, maybe a cactus over here. And uh, yeah. OK, so we have a Western scene. Forgive my art. Now, the sender on cue attempts telepathically to send to this. This is called a beaconing experiment in modern day. Uh, in the last 20 years, we conducted things like this in the military to experiment with it. It's called beaconing. What would happen over here, generally, and as you'll see in, in any textbook or any laboratory work, over and over and over again, the receiver will produce something like this. Um, notice there's no scale or perspective. But elements of the target area are present. We have the mountain. We have an archetype for the mountains here. A general abstract symbolic sketch for the mountains. An abstract symbolic sketch for the hat and the head on the horse horseback, uh, the rider on horseback. Uh, and an abstract symbolic circle representing the sun. And that's about all that the receiver will get in this case here. And uh, any reasonable person with a, with a whole um, portfolio of this kind of work could would draw the conclusion that there's something here. The key thing about the military's uh, involvement with remote viewing was to show that anyone can do this. The only equipment you need is a human brain. Once people are aware that they have this ability, I think great strides will be taken in all mankind. As far as all of us being able to get along, knowing that we all have an extraordinary power that we're born with and that we're basically the same. Well, I can see uh, applications in all aspects of my life, you know, perceiving my own future, other people's futures, or just improving my intuition is a, is a big, would be a big plus. Allowing it to me to focus on uh, a particular project, just focusing my mind on a particular project right now is a very important uh, point for me. Uh, if I am able to complete, uh, look into the future of the past or other current events differently, I might be able to gather more information on a particular idea that I need to obtain for, whether it be financial, I, that's been coming up. I think a, a bigger aspect for me would be medical. What am I doing right to my body? Am I taking too many vitamins or not enough? Uh, what am I doing to uh, other people are doing to their body? Are they taking the wrong kind of foods? Is coffee good for you today or is, is tea better? That kind of a thing. I can see a lot of applications for that. I believe that this skill can be used on the global level to be able to find new and improved sources of food, how we might be able to um, better handle some of our environmental problems that we're experiencing right now. And I think it, it I think the applications are limitless. The discoverer of these protocols does not teach anymore. And he's one man and if, if people only knew how much work it took to personally train people, it, it, it's an extremely draining experience to train people in a skill that is life-changing. So we would have you know, three students per class, and each one of the three students would be going through you know, this, this tremendous 
realization that here they could do something that they had only dreamt of or never never dreamt of their lives that they could do so each person that we trained individually went through a life changing experience during the class normally what would happen is people would come to our class you know wanting to believe it it was real we had we had some skeptics who would come through to actually to try and debunk it um, but for the most part people wanted to believe it but this, you don't really believe it until you do it you have a mountain you saw that's natural and you have a wavy saw that's what's the texture right there touch it soft still can you taste it touch it yeah, it tastes kind of grainy. Yeah, but write it down. Tastes grainy. Grainy. Okay, I want you to end this. Uh, you're going to work again in a few minutes, but end this at uh, at 5:05. The key is two things: learning the learning the structure, learning what questions to ask, learning how you know, learning to ask the right question. There's a lot of data that we can get. Our, our perceptual apparatus, our antennae, really work well if we know how to use it. So a lot of times if we don't know, it's just asking the right question. For instance, you know, what is this right here? Well, it's white and it's soft and, well, it must be water. Is there any other way, a dipstick that you can use to probe? Well, is there a dipstick that you can use to probe it? Yeah, you have more senses. Taste it. What's it taste like? Does water taste grainy? Oh, no, that no, it doesn't. Yeah. So you use your perceptual it apparatus. Tastes like cotton. Tastes like, yeah. Tasted grainy. Tasted grainy. Tasted grainy. That was the data. The, mo the first one is the right one. So use all these sensors as a dipstick. You know, get good sensory contact. So I go th you go through asking questions of all the senses. The in a, in, you, I'm going to teach you the right way to do okay. it. All I'm showing, instructing you right now is, that, is how accurate our senses are. They're primal. They go right to our reptilian rat brains. It's primal, primal stuff, and you can trust them. You can trust your stage ones. You can trust your stage twos. You can trust your stage threes every single time. Imagination isn't going to interfere with that process. Okay? And we'll learn how to do it systematically. That's wavy land. Wavy land. So I, I yeah. got the wavy land, I got the mountain yeah. peak. You can see actually that it's a profile. There's two ways of looking at stage one. It's, it's, it's sort of like a profile, the way the mind's eye would track the profile of the site, or the way we would feel if we were actually bouncing across the site too. So This is wavy, the, really the gestalt here, it's, the gestalt is mountain. Which is mm -hmm. here. And wavy land. Hmm. And it's all natural. It's outside. Okay. Soft land. Don't arbitrarily assume that a wavy, that a wavy line like that is water. Especially when you taste it and it's green. Yeah, it was like <laughs> crunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Soft and cotton. Yeah, I just put your mouth in the bun. You did tail. put it in my. You did. You put my wait, mouth there. I'm like, wait till I push you in the center of the sun. Please. <laughs> first target I sketched a cliff basically that's was the object that uh, I for whatever reason through the training was able to pick up and um, it turned out the target was Devil's Tower well, when I took my drawing and moved it 90 degrees to, um, sideways it looked just like Devil's Tower that was the first session the first day and that was the, the big shock and from there it just got better and better as an example of how really exciting this can be, again starting with two four-digit numbers in an early exercise, I perceived a meeting place of approximately 40 people of different kinds who met to exchange something like currency for products and services. I could describe the temperatures, the sounds, and there was nothing like a cold, gigantic rock or any alien life form. And yet and still, I was able to say that these people had come for mutual benefit, 
no one felt that they were getting the short end of the stick in this transaction. And again, I'm saying, this is amazing, I've come up with this description from the two four-digit numbers, and again, I was delighted to know that that target was the New York Stock Exchange. The Australian Aborigine calls it dream time, using thought to travel through time and space. It was ignored by modern Western civilization until the Pentagon used it for spying in the 70s. We have discovered techniques and we employ them that allow us to listen to the unconscious mind, to listen to this very weak signal of the unconscious talking to us. They say they are not psychics, but highly trained technical remote viewers. Major Ed Dames was part of the Army's remote viewing unit. Now he's founded a company called SciTech, which offers extrasensory information for hire. By using a particular protocol, in other words, by using very specific procedures, the remote viewer can place him or herself in the past, in the present, and in the future. This is the viewer attempting Cytex to work Cytex's current out project, the, the explosion of TWA Flight 800. What I want to make clear to the NTSB, they're desperately trying to seek an answer to the problem in the fuel system. And that's not the case. The remote viewers began to actually sketch a specific part of the aircraft. Semi-soft, hard. Motion for retrace the 80 grams. Oh, the structure. Let's take it again. Put your retrace pen the 80 grams at the same speed. Fresh. That's not the Sweet. Temperatures. Warm. What are we looking at right here? We are looking at a schematic representation of an air-driven pump, a hydraulic pump aboard the aircraft. A part of the hydraulic system, a pump, a hydraulic pump, the shaft in the hydraulic pump broke, it fractured the housing that it was in, and that shrapnel from that caused, caused the rest of the explosion. This particular sketch done by my vice president oh. is very much like this particular schematic here. If this would have been a bomb attack, this sketch would have been a sketch, a rough sketch of people. I determined that it was somewhere behind this wing, right in this area of the plane, on the right side of the plane. They, they knew something was wrong, and they were panicking. And I think before uh, they could really know much more, it happened. So you were actually hearing? Sure. You were actually feeling? You perceive, you are a super receptor when you do this. Not only do you perceive three dimensions, you perceive emotions, mindsets. This was an absolute fluke. It was a freak accident, I think about as freak as the crankshaft in your automobile braking. It just doesn't happen that often. Paula Tutman, Nightbeat. The most important thing that SciTech or I could have done for the public, for anybody, was to have developed these training techniques, these tools, and put them into a package that could be provided to the community, could be provided to other people, to transfer our knowledge to the public. No, there isn't any, any mission, there isn't any job, there isn't any thing that SciTech could have done more important than to transfer our technology into the public domain. Nothing was more important than that. My, my responsibility, my feeling for what my responsibility is, is to continue to train the public. It'll be a while before everything that I know, all of my experiences in remote viewing, and all of my knowledge about the skill can be transferred in toto to the public. That will take a little while longer. But it's, it will be done. And when it's done, I'm free to do what I want to, as an individual to use the skills that I've acquired over the years for my own erudition, for my own pleasure, to have fun with it. The UFO problem is, happens to be one of those things that are, that are important to me in terms of fun, in terms of uh, excitement and adventure. But that's a personal thing we still feel obligated to teach and we will for quite a while there are some uh, some powerful tools that we're actually working with one uh, specifically is 
how to how do we nail down time how do we know where we are in time or when we are and uh, we have one in particular one thing that we are working with that is is very promising but these are these are problems that have vexed uh, remote viewing uh, ESP for for decades you know where are you in time we get a lot of, of people in what has been termed the new age community saying well we couldn't what you're perceiving be in an alternate reality or in a parallel universe or something like that the answer to that question is I don't know maybe but all of our experience in the military world about what's going to happen next and what I had to do when I walked up to the general who said dames which way is the enemy coming I couldn't say well in a parallel universe the enemy is coming this way or in an alternate reality they may be doing this guess where I would have ended up you know, out the door I had to put my bars on the line and say sir the enemy is coming this way just this way these are the techniques that I've been trained in tomorrow when we wake up the enemy will be over there so I'm availing myself of the same the same worldview the same perspective the same reality that I'm aware of this is the t this this is the arena in which I employ technical remote viewing Whatever is happening in other realities and parallel universes is a theoretical physicist perspective. Recent revelations about the Pentagon's multi-million dollar funding of psychic experiments has some people outraged and others wondering why it was so long in coming. The research focused on remote viewing, a technique in which psychics try to intuit strategic locations, viewing remote locations with the mind's eye only. We do a movement exercise, meaning that we're going to move in to the target more. We want to go to a remote site and see what's there. Whatever is in a hidden room can really be revealed. Something should be visible. Brown, golden, rough, green. This is like opening a new door. This is like putting one foot off into another dimension. Jim Mars is an investigative journalist, among the first to disclose information about the CIA's attempt to emphasize the ESP in espionage. It was hard to crack the nut all the way through. The people who had actually participated in this remote viewing had all signed secrecy oaths. They all wanted to talk about the experience. You know, this is really something, you know. But they were constrained. Gentlemen, uh, With the consent of Congress, psychic experiments received full funding for more than 20 years. And according to former remote viewers who must remain anonymous, there were successes. During the Iran hostage crisis, for example, remote viewers were able to describe the exact location where some hostages were being held. In 1982, when Brigadier General James Dozier was kidnapped by Italian terrorists, remote viewers helped guide anti-terrorist commandos to the building and even the room where Dozier was being held. The military people who started this whole program, they were looking for results. They didn't care how it worked. They just wanted to know if it worked. And obviously they felt like it was working. It was during the Cold War in the 1960s that the potential for remote viewing first came to the attention of the American military after intelligence reports revealed that Russia was already using psychic espionage effectively. This got the boys in the Pentagon going, you know, and, and their attitude was, we don't think there's anything to that, but if the Soviets are doing it, we've got to do it too. Early studies conducted at the Stanford Research Institute were crude and haphazard. Psychic Ingo Swan was among the first to be called into the program. When I first started in 1970, that control was sporadic. Some days the experiments did not work. But as I became more professionally involved with research and began to understand the processes involved, the control was probably about 95% effective. As Swan's proficiency increased, so did his ability to analyze what... Now. 
anyway, had to be 85% correct 85% of the time. And they had to know when they were in error. You, you see, you can't take remote viewing and say, look, we can be successful 10% of the time or 20% because that's not competitive to other ways of getting information. But 85%, 95%, this is a whole different thing. Then Major Ed Dames was one of Swan's pupils. Ingo Swan's method allowed us to outperform even the best natural psychics that ever lived and to know when our data was correct. We took this discovery out of the laboratory, if you will, and we developed it into a militarily useful tool that could be used to support intelligence requirements in the event of a life or death situation or where deadly force was, was necessary. News of the remote viewing success rate spread quickly, and by the mid-1970s, the program was part of the Army's Intelligence and Security Command. And within 10 years, psychic espionage was being used by several branches of the U.S. government. They were looking for Soviet submarines. They were locating uh, satellites. They were locating uh, biochemical warfare facilities, rocket launching sites. They even worked with other agencies. They participated in some programs looking for drug renting ships. Even the CIA, uh, on more than one occasion, asked them to uh, try to see if they could locate moles, uh, penetrating agents uh, for an enemy power within the CIA. But in the late 1980s, an influx of new leadership changed the future of remote viewing. With the advent of the DIA, there was a civilian leadership that took over. And these people were ran the gamut from people who were just aghast that anybody was even looking at something so silly, uh, all the way to people who were just big believers. You know? and the first thing you know, they had channelers coming in, they had crystal ball gazers coming in. Uh, remote viewing got pushed ever further back into the background. The unit itself began to be used in less than honorable ways. Disillusioned, dames and others from the remote viewing unit left to form a private consulting firm, SciTech. According to dames, in 1991, during the Gulf War, SciTech was contacted by the NSC, the National Security Council, and asked to psychologically locate Saddam Hussein's biological weapons facilities and to pinpoint the location of Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. Patty Dreyer was one of SciTech's professionally trained remote viewers. I would describe it as not being limited by time or space and to be able to gather information about a person, place, or thing, any time. It feels as though I'm in two places at the same time, and yet I'm here writing information. So it's almost like a split of some kind. In some ways, it's as significant in terms of the evolution of man as the discovery of fire. The more people that learn these techniques and know how to do this or relearn it, perhaps man had these abilities and lost them at one time, the less secrets there will be. But just recently, the CIA released a report stating that remote viewing successes cannot be corroborated and recommending that the Pentagon pull the plug. This also comes into one of the aspects about the report that has just been made public by the CIA to the effect that, well, there seems to be some statistical basis for uh, the fact that something's happening there in remote viewing, but we really don't think there's much to it. And this comes back to the scientific problem, which is if they can't explain why it does something, then it can't be happening. But I think tip-off to the success of our program is the fact that it continued to be funded for a quarter of a century. So obviously somebody thought they were getting results from this. When the Jet Propulsion Lab first got photography of Mars, where there were what appeared to be non-fractal images, possibility, possible artificial images that stood out in JPL photography, uh, Harold put off asked Ingo Swan and several other remote viewers to take a look at these enigmatic features on the, on the surface of the planet. And when all of the viewers came back, in each independently working that, those particular pro that particular problem, the problem being, here's a geographic coordinate on the planet Mars, take a look at it, coming back with the impressions that these were structures, man-made structures, I use that term loosely at least right now, and not purely natural terrain features, that's when I got really interested in Mars. Then there were certain, then I began to look at UFO 
sightings in general using technical remote viewing at that time coordinate remote viewing because I had not yet worked out the bugs in coordinate remote viewing so that's when I became intensely interested in the phenomenon my job was service to my country UFOs had nothing to do with service to my country so it had to be a back burner issue for me or a personal issue not a part of my job but the intensity of the attraction towards UFOs the attack the the, the the intensity began to grow as a challenge because the scientific community could not discern could not break this crack this problem it was too tough a nut that became a challenge to me I was always attracted to something that was, other people said was impossible that, that those are the challenges that I took for, for myself when some when I heard the word impossible my ears perked up say what what's impossible again because, and then those things are were usually what became challenges to me personal challenges that I massaged into the framework I institutionalized them to make it credible uh, I'm sorry I institutionalized those challenges to make them valid in the venue in which I was employed that is as a military intelligence officer I am still an investigator that's what I'm doing here I followed uh, I followed a smoking gun, and I followed our, uh, a technical remote viewing trail, chain of custody, to places here in Polynesia that we very well know to be extremely hot, active sites that I'm about to penetrate in the next several months. We have knowledge, using technical remote viewing, of a very unique artifact of, in a very unique place. We've located that on the map, and now it's time to go there physically to go to a geographic location, subterranean, possibly submarine location. We have the equipment to do that. We're ready to go. And it is not the first time that I've done this. All of my experience as a military officer has been right along these lines. Where is the enemy? Where are the hostages? What's the location? Now go get them. This is, to me, that all of the years of military, it's a military mission mentality. We're here, we're here in the beginning of a field survey. We have our equipment with us. Uh, the, the item of interest ap appears to be in a, uh, in a cave, possibly submerged. We have equipment with us to do some cursory field work to get close enough to it to determine what we'll need on the next trip to actually touch the artifact or get close to it. We have a tool that we've been able to use effectively at, like no one else has ever been able to, to use it. That is technical remote viewing. And we're expert at this. We can really make this thing get up and dance, this remote viewing phenomenon. We do it as a business. We've used this tool. Uh, we've availed ourselves to it to great stead. We've uncovered something that's very, very unique in time space here in Polynesia connected it could be it could be the Rosetta Stone for the whole UFO problem that's how we look at it now whether or not SciTech's going to share that it is called remote viewing and it's been used to help solve some of the world's biggest mysteries like the location of kidnapped Americans during the Iran hostage crisis or the explosion of TWA Flight 800 recently. Once used by the military, remote viewing is now employed by the private sector as well, but it's always been and still is very controversial. Tonight, UPN News 13 investigates remote viewing. Tammy Taylor is here right now with a story. Very interesting. Yes, Alan, controversial because you can't really explain how it works, at least in a physics type of mode. But it, it, we all know that hey, we've all had somebody who has had some kind of a psychic experience or we know somebody, you've had it. But is it possible to sit in a room and see, hear, feel, and sense something that is somewhere else in space and time? Something that is a specific target. The U.S. military spent $20 million to develop the technique to do just that. A technique which is still being used in the civilian world today. Where were Iranian terrorists hiding kidnapped Americans during the hostage crisis? Where did Italy's Red Brigades keep an abducted American general? What really caused the crash of TWA Flight 800? And why did a Los Angeles City Fire Department rescue helicopter go down in Griffith Park in a fatal crash? 
It's claimed all of these unrelated mysteries have been solved by something you've probably never heard of. 1980, the Iran hostage crisis. The U.S. military uses a super top secret unit of psychic spies to locate the kidnapped Americans. You had the Americans who were captured in the embassy and we were trying to find out where they were, what their condition was. Colonel John Alexander was in the Army's Intelligence and Security Command at the time. He says one of the intelligence gathering devices used during the hostage crisis was remote viewing. Remote viewing initially started as just uh, data acquisition at a, at a distance, if you will, the ability of people to use their mind to go out and get information and bring it back. In fact, Alexander says the doomed Desert One operation to rescue the hostages was launched based in part on intelligence provided by remote viewers. The people had been providing information, but Remember, not the only source. We use multiple sources of gathering information, remote viewing being one of them. Sandy, try arid. Technical remote viewing was first developed by the Stanford Research Institute, the nation's second largest think tank back in the late 1970s. There, an extremely gifted psychic named Ingo Swan determined that the process could be learned by almost anyone. He developed a model for training that was used by the U.S. military in the 1980s. Swan's protege, a young major named Ed Dames. Viewers are trained by not knowing consciously what the target is. We are, they are only given in training and in operations a, a, a random number connected with the targeting officer's target. That's it. Major Ed Dames became operations and training officer of the top secret unit. Show me the top. Are you going down a hole or what? Remote viewing is a systematic way that unconscious, the unconscious mind, delivers up accurate information to conscious awareness. That was the breakthrough discovery. Here's how it works. We're immersed in an information, think of an information field. All things are, are made up of information. And our conscious attention can direct itself the same way you would direct yourself to a book in the library or a site on the internet. The process involves several stages and often many sessions. Okay, temperatures, ambient. Using rigid. It can be very complex, like this one drawn by a remote viewer who sketched a remarkable resemblance of his target, which was unknown to him at the time, the Lawrence Livermore Labs in Northern California. We had to have a tool that availed itself of, of our psychic faculty, but had to be dead on every time to support military operations where deadly force was authorized or in the case of life and death. The intelligence community used data from the Army's remote viewing unit in a number of high-profile cases. Another case was when General Dozier was captured by the Red Brigade in Italy. It's a good example because in there they were able to get some pretty accurate information about his immediate surroundings. And through they remote viewing? Through remote viewing. Colonel Alexander says the remote viewers accurately determined the city where General Dozier was being held. Trouble was, the information about Dozier's immediate surroundings was too immediate. Extremely accurate information that wasn't very useful. They had this uh, diagram of a tent and they couldn't figure out the tent and how it fit and, and all of that. Well, it turns out that when he was captured, he was kept in a house, but they had a tent which was, you know, accurately portrayed by the remote viewers. What they didn't get very well is exactly where the house was. Was the tent in the house? The tent was in the house. Target is inside. How accurate is remote viewing? Well, for a trained remote viewer, we're about 80% accurate on, on any particular session. 80% of the data that we derive using technical remote viewing will, will be attributable to the target. There are ways, however, to increase the hit rate uh, dramatically. But one of the approaches is to use several remote viewers, and then you start looking for, uh, when they come back with data, you know, does it uh, correlate? Uh, with each other, and that will give you a, a much better chance of getting uh, accuracy. The Army spent $20 million researching and applying remote viewing, but then the leadership of the program changed, 
and the unit started bringing in channelers and crystal ball gazers. That was more than Ed Dames could take, so he quit, took his best remote viewers, and formed a private consulting firm called SciTech. Eventually, the military program was cut. The issue became a, a trade-off. Uh, do I want to work on developing this, or do I want to buy more guns? Guns won. In all of my days in very dark, deep intelligence work, I have never seen a program such as this one, the Psychic Intelligence Unit, that was subject to more ostracism, more fear, more covetousness, uh, more loathing. It was a hot potato, a white elephant, everything. It, it, was a, it was such a controversial thing. Now, just because the military killed the program doesn't mean remote viewing is dead. It is very much alive, and people are being trained to do it all over the country. Tomorrow, we investigate just how it's being used today, how well it works, and we will put remote viewing to the test ourselves. The most interesting thing to me about it is that the, the target is blind to the remote viewer. The remote viewer does not know what the target is. All they are given is a random set of numbers to which specific search things are attached. It's really interesting. It's amazing, Fascinating. It's amazing what we don't know about the brain and Isn't what it's it? capable of doing. Yes. Oh, we'll see right. you tomorrow. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Tammy. The most significant effect that remote viewing has had upon me, and I think upon most people to learn it, hands down, is the fact that one knows, if you're armed with these skills, that you can know anything you want to know. That you, could, you no longer have to go through life. If you've gone through life wondering about things and, and thinking that you will never know about what happened here or what's going on over here, you never have to think that way anymore. There's nothing that you cannot know by virtue of having learned this as a skill. And that fact changes everything. It changes one's outlook on life forever. Even if you choose not to put in the work to know something about what's going on over there or what happened in the paleontological past uh, back here, you know that you could know. And that fact changes your perspective forever. It's an innate ability. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to train just anybody off the street. I mean, that was a, a realization in and of itself, is when we began to loosen up the constraints of who we were accepting into our training program. We had people from all walks of life, and there was not one that we were not successful in training. They were all able to do this. We, we had businessmen come through the, the course thinking that, um, okay, if I do this, at least I, I will have a way at which I can make more money. They would end up leaving the course looking at what was contentment and happiness in life. And, and it expands their horizons that it wasn't all revolving around money and success in, in their careers. The draw for me was was a was probably a personal question that, that I w was dealing with and probably we all deal with is that why are we here? Uh, are we here to make more money to collect more and more toys and you know work towards old age? It it really not I didn't think this but I felt this that truly that consciousness itself that is how the human is, is to evolve. And I, I don't really see it happening physically or in any other way, but, but what else is there other than consciousness that uh, is, is an avenue for evolution of, of, of the human species? It sounds, you know, it sounds lofty and idealistic, but it, there really is a, a real kernel of, of truth to that. that and that has been inside me, and this was just a, a light that came on, and I, I pursued uh, quite diligently. Is it possible to determine the cause of a plane crash having never visited the crash site? Remote viewers say they can do it, like in the case of TWA Flight 800. How does remote viewing work and is it accurate? Tonight, UPN News 13 investigates psychic intelligence putting one remote viewer to the test while our cameras were rolling. 
Tammy Taylor is here now with the findings. This is so interesting. Tammy. It really is. Now, it's hard to believe that someone could be trained to sit in a room, zero in on a blind target, and come up with accurate information about something that is somewhere else in space and time. But we watched it for ourselves. It's called remote viewing, and the U.S. military spent $20 million to develop this mind-boggling technique. It was the most bizarre contest of the Cold War. Russian intelligence was experimenting heavily with psychics, telekinesis, and other paranormal activities. At the same time, the U.S. was doing some psychic spooking of its own. Psychics were used to try to get some type of insight, some type of a starting point, a clue on a military problem, usually problems of great importance. Major Ed Dames was the operations and training officer of a super top secret army unit that used the powers of the mind to collect intelligence. There are ways of training people to go into an altered state again and again and again, training again to do specific things that does allow any individual to gain a modicum of information about a distant target. They call it remote viewing. The secret unit's clientele, the CIA, Secret Service, Defense Intelligence Agency, FBI. Major Dames left the unit eight years ago and formed a private consulting firm called SciTech, but he's still addressing military problems, including in 1991, when the head of the UN inspection team asked Dames and his remote viewers to find the spot where Saddam Hussein was hiding bioweapons. The tactic of desperation, uh, the head of that team, uh, Major Karen Jansen, came to SciTech asking for help. And you were able to accurately find it? Yes. We sketched the locations in specific areas, Samara was one, uh, where these sites were and, uh, and how the team could find them. So they were able to take our maps and sketches back to, to their site, not waste a tremendous amount of time or money. And they found them? Yes, they found them. Dames and SciTech now do technical remote viewing and training on a private basis. We can help investigators save a lot of time, and we help engineers and scientists and doctors uh, save a lot of money. We asked Colonel Alexander just how accurate is remote viewing. Sometimes it works. You have spectacular hits, you have spectacular failures. Dames may have had a near hit in the case of TWA Flight 800. Before all the, the, the debris of that aircraft was pulled out of the water, we worked the cause of that explosion, thinking perhaps it may have been a bombing. We were able to pinpoint the source of the explosion as the failure, a mechanical failure, that hydraulic pump breaking apart and the shrapnel puncturing fuel lines. Investigators have never been able to pinpoint the exact cause, but suspect an explosion in a fuel tank. And I don't think you can go back in retrospect and say, ah, we had this, see how it almost fits. Being almost right has been one of the major problems with remote viewing. We decided to put remote viewing to the test ourselves. The target we chose, the Los Angeles City Fire Department helicopter. target is assigned a random set of numbers. That's the only information the remote viewer is given. In this case, it's 11471524. Two sets of four-digit numbers. Okay. And we go from here. Joni Durif will do the session. She does not know what the target is. The entire process is standardized. Everybody does it the same way, just like in the Army. The session starts. Joni is given the set of numbers. 11 Four seven one five two four. Curving down, curving under, diagonal down, mechanical sounds. Sound like were rotating. Movement, rotating, oblong. She uses words and sketches to hone in on the target. After several specific stages, the information is drawn into a composite. I'm dealing with uh, people inside of a structure. How many people? Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, 
four that are important anyway. Um, and the people are doing something that's searching. You've got motion lines all over the place here. The what? motion, uh, be, I would say, are mechanical and people moving back and forth. Okay, basically. and you've got this and oblong thing here. this is somehow here. related to the target. You're not pointing at a person. No, I'm pointing at a, a thing. A thing? Uh-huh. Okay. But it's somehow related to this. What she is pointing to is the oblong rotating object, which is sketched a distance from the actual target. The NTSB's preliminary investigation notes that the helicopter's two tail rotor blades were found a mile from the main wreckage and that the device that connects them to the helicopter, something called a yoke assembly, had a fatigue fracture. We're in the air. There's a lot of motion here. See the rotation, the movement this way? We're not dealing with pilot error. Her pen did not go to one of the individuals. It went to an object here that's associated with this rotating thing up here, which we know, because we consciously have awareness of the target, was the rotor on the helicopter. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty impressed. That remote viewing session lasted about 45 minutes. My photographer, Tony Butita, picked the target. I came up with the random numbers, and at no time was Ed Dames out of my sight or able to slip Joni information about what the target would be before the session began. Normally, many more sessions would be conducted to get more specific information about the target. Now, if you would like more information on remote viewing, you can contact SciTech. They're in Beverly Hills. Their phone number is 310-657-9829, or you can find them on the Internet at wwwtrv scitech Com. How could you not be impressed with that? That was amazing. I sat in the room for the whole thing, and I can't tell you how creepy it was yeah. to, to sit there and, and listen and it, watch it the whole thing. It won you over. Huh? And to begin with made-up numbers that have no bearing on anything. I don't understand. It gives me a headache. That is phenomenal. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> okay, you made believers out of a lot of people, <laughs> sure. All right, thank you.